That's all. Hi. Y'all are welcome.
We would now like to highlight how the project has been designed to eliminate any impact on the rural character of the area. The project will be set back 50 feet from property lines, 100 feet from public right-of-ways, and 500 feet from any residences. These setbacks are shown on CBP 101 of the site plan. In addition to these large setbacks, the project will be completely screened from view using a buffer that consists of either existing natural vegetation or a 10-foot earthen berm and a double row of 5-foot offset evergreens on top. APP 106 of our application contains computer renderings by third-party licensed engineer, Kimley Horn, to show how the screen will look from various viewpoints. And just to note, we have provided um, those visual renderings for you all's reference. Um, we have them at a couple different locations. Uh, the first location is showing what it will look off of Valdosta Highway or Highway 133. Um, and so in this one, you can see at the time of planting, uh, there will be the 10-foot urban berm with the 5-foot offset evergreens, and it will provide 100% clearance from the uh, solar panels. And then um, the bottom picture there has it at year 5, where the offset evergreens will reach a minimum height of 10 feet on top of the 10-foot urban berm in total providing a 20-foot screen. This one just shows um, what the existing vegetation would look like. So we plan to keep as much existing vegetation um, on the edge of the project as possible to utilize the screening. Um, so in this rendering in particular, we added in the five-foot offset evergreens just to fill in any gaps and ensure that there is 100% screening. And then in this last one, um, same uh, concept in off of Guest Road, I believe it is. Um, you have the 10-foot earthen berm and the 5-foot evergreens on top. In addition to these large setbacks, the project will be... Oh, the setbacks and screening will also ensure that no local residents are affected by any noise associated with the operational equipment of the project. To visually demonstrate the noise levels that will be heard across the site, Kinley Warren engineers have produced a noise rendering showing the maximum sound levels of all equipment. This rendering can be found in Exhibit 4, especially such an application. As you can see, the different colors demonstrate different levels of sound at different locations, and a comparison chart gives a practical reference for what each level of sound is like. As all residents are a minimum of 500 feet from any equipment, the maximum noise that can be heard <coughs> off-site would be no louder than 50 decibels, which is comparable to the sound of a running refrigerator. It should be noted that this rendering does not account for the additional sound barrier effect the vegetative screening will have with the 10-foot earthen berm, so it is unlikely these noise levels will even be heard outside of the project area. Um, so as you can see, the red dots just show where the inverters are, and those are the loudest um, items on site, and we try to strategically place those to be um, away from the edges of the, the project boundary where we could. Um, and so, as you can see, most of the site is in green, just meaning that it's going to be 45 decibels or lower, um, with on average it being about 50. And so, um, there should be no impact from neighbors due to um, the placement of the inverters and also the in response to concerns voiced about impacting real estate values, we have commissioned a third-party Georgia license appraiser to report on the project's potential effect. The appraisal studies the specific factors that typically <coughs> correlate with downward adjustments on property values and highlighted that since solar facilities don't produce any traffic, odors, or pollution, the project will have no impact on real estate. The appraisal notes that other project studies did not have educated buffers providing 100% screening, and they still showed no decreased property values overall. In some cases, property values next to solar facilities actually increased because they provided rare security that the same view will be seen for at least 40 years, rather than the potential for residential, commercial, or other development to be constructed at any time. With this, we can confirm there will be no decrease in the value of land or rural character. The appraisal has been submitted to the record for review, um, which is a part of the packet that was submitted today. Finally, to address any concerns that the project will not be properly maintained, we would like to highlight that the county solar ordinance contains provisions requiring a solar project to cease operations if the buffer does not provide a visual screening to all residential properties and right ways. Uh, 
To mitigate the environmental impact, the project's plans include the following considerations. Page DPP 103 and 103A of the site plan provides a preliminary sediment and erosion control plan. This ensures any erosion or sediment disturbed during construction does not travel off-site or into waterways. As Brooks County is not a local issuing authority for stormwater permitting, this plan will be reviewed by the Georgia EPD and is subject to revision at their discretion. As recommended by the planning board as a condition of our special exception approval, the final plan will be given to Brooks County once approved. To ensure the project doesn't damage local roads, the planning board recommended that as a condition of our special exception approval, we should execute a road use agreement with the county that requires us to maintain any roads to their existing state throughout construction. We have no objection to this proposal and have already shared the proposed draft with the county attorney. We will also be building and improving any access roads per Georgia DOT requirements and these <coughs> plans must go to Georgia DOT for final review before construction start. Um, and we hope that this road use agreement can be a discussion between us and the county so that we can meet all of the concerns. We did propose in the existing draft that we've done to other counties, but we know that this county we have specific needs that need to be addressed. So we are more than happy to sit down and go through that and figure out what the what best path forward is for road use. Uh, we'll go to, the <coughs> to ensure the project doesn't have any have an effect on any threatened or endangered species, we commissioned a Georgia licensed environmental consultant, Terracon, to thoroughly survey the site. The results of the survey are on page CDP 104 and 105 of the site plan, which shows that the only species likely to be on site, but was not actually seen on site, is a gopher tortoise. The species is listed as threatened at the state level, but not at the federal level due to their increasing populations in the U.S. To protect this potential tortoise, Pine Gate has collaborated with Terracon to create a habitat mitigation plan that can be found on page CDP 104A and 104B, which was submitted with our initial special exception application in December. The Georgia DNR recommends that a 15-foot buffer be placed around all gopher tortoise burrows with corridors. Out of abundance of a caution, we will be placing a conservative 25-foot buffer around all identified burrows, and during construction, we will install a silt fence along the southern edge of the buffers to minimize the chance of any tortoises wandering on the site, but allow them to roam freely to the north away from the site. In addition to these measures, we will be following best management practices to protect wildlife. This includes installing natural fiber erosion mesh to prevent wildlife entanglement and securing the site with wildlife-friendly fencing to minimize habitat fragmentation. The details that were submitted today were just details um, on the wildlife-friendly fencing and also our standard maintenance uh, once operation is conduct. Um, but again, the habitat mitigation plan was submitted with the original special exception uh, back in December. The project has also been designed designed to minimize tree clearing. The tree clearing map on page 107 of the site plan shows that only 9.6% of the total acreage will be cleared. It should be noted that a considerable portion of the site is already slated for timber roads. In addition, Kimberly Moore conducted a tree survey to identify the tree quantity, quality, and species types so that we will be able to replant the same type and quantity of trees once the project has been decommissioned. The tree survey can be found on ZPP 107A. <coughs> to mitigate any negative impacts on watersheds, the project has been designed to completely avoid jurisdictional wetlands and have mineral disturbance to non-jurisdictional wetlands. The map on page APP 107, as seen by Andrew, shows the results of the on-site wetland delineation that was completed by Terracon with the U.S. Army. To note, the main reason for numerous access roads and non-contiguous design of the facility, which was highlighted in the staff report, is the direct result of the project avoiding jurisdictional wetlands despite the increased costs. We'd also like to highlight that we'll be regularly maintaining vegetation on site for the life of the project. We will do this predominantly through mechanical means, which means that no fertilizers or pesticides will be leaching from the site to wetlands for at least four years. Due to concern related to the health and safety of the public on the project, we have engaged two different third-party consultants. Kimley Moore created memos related to groundwater contamination and radiation, and a solar health and safety expert, Tom Cleveland, 
has completed an assessment on potential effects of solar. The memos from Kamley Horn reference published studies that confirm the following. While solar panels do generate extremely weak electromagnetic fields like cell phones do, they produce minuscule amounts of non-ionizing radiation or heat, which has no effect on human health. Solar panels are also specifically designed to encapsulate any hazardous components to prevent leaking, but even if the panels were broken down and distributed across the site, any potentially hazardous, hazardous materials and chemicals are well below the EPA's hazardous threshold and would not contaminate groundwater or create a threat to human health. Uh, both of these were submitted into the record today. The assessment completed by the solar health and safety expert runs through many of the concerns noted from the community, including, but not limited to, electrical fires, glare, noise, and on-site safety. This assessment concludes that the project will have no effect on human health or safety. We note the Planning Commission recommended that the project be agreed with conditions, but to close out this review of the application, we would also like to directly respond to general concerns highlighted in the staff report. While this project will not create permanent jobs on site, it will still have significant direct economic benefits for Brooks County. This will not just be in the form of high volume business for local vendors during construction, but also the opportunities for employment within our sister construction company, Blue Ridge Power. The current national labor shortage is particularly seen in the solar industry due to its relative efficiency and rapid growth. To address this, Blue Ridge Power has introduced a range of workforce development programs through an initiative called Power Up. More detailed information on these programs can be found on uh, Exhibit 6 and 7 of the application. But in short, these programs provide solar training to candidates ranging from high school students all the way to experienced technicians. This will create skilled workers and fill full-time permanent positions that are widely available throughout Blue Ridge Power. While it's not possible to source all of the project's 200 plus construction crew from the local area, we have had projects like East Over Solar in South Carolina that employed and trained 32 permanent employees from the local county. These 32 skilled workers will continue to construct other kind of projects, and we expect to see a similar level of employment with the Morgan Solar Project in Brooks County as we develop projects in the South Florida region. As a part of these efforts, Blue Ridge Power has already started working with Howard Akers, the work-based learning coordinator for Brooks County Schools, and will be attending the Brooks County High School Career Fair this month. It was asked at the planning meeting what exactly the project will bring in tax-wise, and a more detailed estimate of the county tax revenue has been completed by our Georgia tax attorneys in the case that there is no tax abatement, which was with our package today. This, estimates, uh, this estimate has been submitted into the record and based on the 2022 millage rate and tax receipts of the properties involved in the project, within the first 10 years, the project will contribute approximately $3.25 million in tax revenue. This represents a 1,850% increase compared to the tax revenue currently being generated from the properties today. The project is still seeking to submit an IRB with the Brooks County Development Authority, but due to the county's IRB policy and high fee structure, even if the project is awarded the tax incentive, the project will still contribute over $3 million in taxes and fees in the first 10 years. Finally, we would like to reiterate that the purpose statement within the solar ordinance is to, quote, encourage development of solar facilities outside of urban development areas, and thus made solar a permanent use on ag land through a special exception. The staff report recommends the denial of the project despite our application meeting all code requirements. Due to this, we would like to highlight the required constitutional statement that has been submitted into the record as it draws attention to the fact that the denial of the application would result in no gain or benefit to the public while inflicting substantial loss to the property owners of the project. Furthermore, it would constitute a taking by the government without just compensation and due process of law. In this regard, our landowners have asked us to point out that they not only believe the project supports their farmland and rural lifestyle, but also that as taxpaying residents of Brooks County, they have the right under the Georgia Constitution to use their land in any meaningful matters to which they choose without hindrance from governmental overreach. Thank you for your consideration of our special exception application for the welcome and questions from the board. I just had a few. Um, 
The highest elevation point in Brooks County is on your proposed site. It's 50 feet higher than the surrounding area. Are you going to take the topography of that land down 50 feet so the solar fields aren't seen from the adjacent properties? So the project will have to be graded either way um, to make sure that we have a pretty flat landscape. Um, we also need to use the dirt to create the urban berm around the site. Um, so the panels themselves are 15 feet in height and the planting um, at start of operations will total to 15 feet. Um, if there's any areas that for some reason are able to be seen, um, we note that you know as a part of the code it says it has to be 100% screen. So we would be more than happy at that point to add any additional um, vegetative screening if needed. Um, but our estimates are showing that with the clearing it, it should um, level out the site and prevent the, the view from neighbors. Okay. Another question. Um, there's been reports that there was a ball eagle nest on, on that land. Not just a ball eagle sighting, but a nest. A bald eagle in a nest on that property. So, how have you seen that or heard that? Or how would you address that? So, we actually had Tara Khan and Jim Baxter is here today. Um, he went out to the site and did a thorough assessment of the property, looking for habitat, including bald eagle species. Um, this was done within the past year. Um, no bald eagle spottings were, were seen, there were no nests seen. Um, as I mentioned, the only um, species habitat that was on site that was active was a, a gopher uh, burrow tourist, gopher tourist yeah. burrow. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, with that, we created the habitat mitigation plan to ensure that. Um, but we will also be giving handouts to all of our construction crew, uh, just with any potential species that were noted that could be on site, although they weren't seen. Um, you know, those habitats will be avoided, but there will be instructions for how to handle those um, species. And then also a um, alert will be given to us and Terracon and the Georgia DMR to address any species and uh, remove them properly. Okay. I, so I, I, I just have a lot of habit. I'm not against solar as, as a project. Solar has its place. In, in areas. But getting into a contract with an LLC, the LLC stands for limited liability corporation. An LLC can go bankrupt at any time. And then there's no there's no recourse for anyone because it's a limited liability. So what's the benefit of finding a group as an LLC? What's the benefit of the county getting to a, to a, a contract or the landowners getting to a contract with an LLC when you could have been an escort, but you're not? You know what I'm saying? So there's so how 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 is this project going to be guaranteed not to fail? I know you're going to be producing energy out of the sun, and that's great. But if, if something happens with your corporation, the LLC. How, how is the county and how are the taxpayers and how are the citizens who are, you, you are using the land, how are they going to do that? Yeah, so the way that we set up project entities is essentially each project is set up under an LLC um, because there are certain permits that you have to have uh, per a, a state qualified LLC. Uh, so for example, with the sediment and erosion control plans, that all has to be going directly to the project itself. Since high gate renewables as an LLC not have any you know, specific assets related to the project other than being the owner of that LLC. You have to tie everything to an LLC. Uh, that way, in the circumstance that, you know, if Pine Bay Renewables goes under or in any circumstance like that, that LLC is then its own asset and it would then move to the uh, investors that uh, help us build these projects. So, and essentially as well when it comes to the commissioning, we'll be posting the bond for the county. So in any circumstance, project is left abandoned or if it's unoperational for 12 months, they'll have that money to then go and decommission the project. Um, they're uh, you know, not leaving any mess for the county to clean up without any funds. And how much is the bond? Um, so that still needs to be discussed with the county. The way the, the code was written just said that a decommissioning bond would be posted. So we uh, provided the decommissioning bond in a letter just because um, in the decommissioning plan, it states what the salvage value is versus what it costs to actually decommission. 
Um, <coughs> different counties like to do it different ways. Some would um, allow some of that salvage value to go towards the amount, so it would be a little bit less. Um, but that was, yeah, something that we wanted to discuss with you all if you were to get the approval of the, what the best way to go about that was. And um, the, the value of the land, you said that it doesn't go down. We do have a property owner whose land value has actually gone down twice because her property is right next to a solar pool. And that is, that is public record. So for you to say they don't go down, that's incorrect. If you walk into the register, you'll see that her property value has gone down. But um, as far as evaluation of, I, I, I see in here you had evaluation of land, but who in Georgia did your property valuation? Uh, so his name's Rich Kirkland. Um, he was a certified appraiser. And also has certifications in Georgia um, as an appraiser. And so he completed this. He has, I um, believe, he said 15 years of experience in doing um, appraisal and support solar farms. Um, he also studied a thousand different solar farm farms across the southeast. Um, essentially, he took averages of what he saw the property values were um, once the solar farms were put in. Um, so that's the data we were pulling that from. Um,